Dave Lawrence. What's up, bud? How you doing? Aloha. Thanks for doing this. Aloha. I'm great. Had a nice Waikiki morning here. We love that. It is uh, member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered, and Dave Lawrence, grateful to have uh, our next guest, who is uh, original Broadway producer of Hamilton. It's Jeffrey Seller, and uh, known for, along with his business partner, he's known for a lot of different stuff, very talented cat, but known, along with Kevin McCollum, producing three best musical Tony Award-winning Broadway shows, Rent, Avenue Q, In the Heights, and of course, also getting credited with innovative approaches to ticketing and performances that we'll hear about. But he's joining us as part of Hamilton coming to stage, obviously original Broadway producer of that. And he's got stories to share about his fascinating life. And we're just so grateful that he'd take some time for us. It's Jeffrey Seller, and we wish him a big aloha and mahalo, my brother. Thank you for doing this. Aloha, Dave. It's so great to be here in Honolulu on Waikiki. I had the best time this morning going to yoga and then taking a dive right into the ocean. Right on. Be better than that. <laughs> well, we're really grateful for your time and that you'd spend a little time uh, just sharing your story with us. Please. This uh, thing on your Wikipedia page first, before we get into some of your productions, this is kind of a neat one, and it leads into one of those, actually, about inventing Broadway's first rush ticket and lottery ticket policies. This was in the time of the production of Rent, yeah? Yes, thank you for mentioning that, because I suppose um, that would be on my obituary, which is that <laughs> when my then partner, Kevin and I, we're producing Rent. You know, we were 31 and 32 years old, and it was a moment in our lives where we could barely afford to see a Broadway show. So we knew that if we were gonna bring Rent to Broadway, we had to make it accessible to everybody, regardless of their ability to pay. And there had been some rush ticketing um, in the past on Broadway, but it was always the worst seats in the house. And it was always only for students. And our we had two points. One is, why should it just be for students? There are many of us who can't afford to go. Mm -hmm. And two, why is it always in the last two rows of the, <laughs> of the top balcony? So we thought, A, let's make it accessible to everybody if they're willing to put in the effort, and B, what if we put it in the first two rows right and on. then all those people who are so excited that they got to see the show for 20 bucks begin a wave that takes the um, energy and the enthusiasm from the first two rows of the orchestra all the way to the last rows of the balcony. In 1996, and what was so satisfying was that it became a policy that almost every single Broadway musical used in the years going forward. And then um, the Metropolitan Opera adopted it as well. That's great. It had this huge impact, uh, as you say, and it opened the doors for a lot of people and it made it much more accessible and open to all kinds of folks. And that was a great show to do it on, too, with uh, with Rant. So and also take us back, I guess, just a little further. And how does a cat get into this kind of thing? Like, for example, as a kid, what were some of the first theatrical experiences, whether they were plays, performances, something you may have attended or worked on in some way, something you were exposed to at school or at home that you attended, maybe first music you, you dug or saw that, that lit the spark? Yes. Well, like many of us, it was through religion. You know, many are in plays at their churches. I'm Jewish. I was in the Purim play at my temple, huh. and for those that don't know it, Purim is the story of Queen Esther from the Old Testament. And at my temple, they used to juxtapose a Purim play against a Broadway musical. So when I was in fourth grade, um, Queen Esther was singing um, from South Pacific, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. And... <laughs> That was the bug. And in that show, not only did I get exposed to Rodgers and Hammerstein, but we also did a couple numbers from Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. So here I was at age nine, being wow. in a play, learning about Rodgers and Hammerstein, learning about Gilbert and Sullivan. And frankly, the day after Purim, on that Sunday morning, I started writing a play in my fourth grade class that I called Adventureland. And um, by fifth grade, I was producing and directing and starring in the play. And by eighth grade, I was um, picking the plays for my youth theater group in the suburbs of Detroit where I was growing up. Um, so people say like, what does the producer do? And I'm like, 
Well, the producer picks the play. And marry that to the concept, because that's great, because a lot of people would ask that very question, like, it sounds like a great role, producer, what does he exactly do? So for people who don't know anything about Hamilton, because it's a wide audience, you know, we're talking to a lot of folks are driving in their car, and they're curious about it, and, and I yes. like, I, lo I love to include everyone, kind of like you did with your, your innovative approach with ticketing. So explain getting in touch with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and then how that ends up being not only one but two different productions that ends up getting you to Hamilton. And then again, how does what do you do with someone else's work that you're the quote unquote producer? I like to think that I am the nurturer of the writer, of the author. I'm the cheerleader. I am the artistic parent who is cheerleading, criticizing with just the right touch making suggestions with just the right touch and really giving that artist all of the resources that they need in order to achieve their goals. In the case of um, Lynn, um, the first show we did together was in the Heights, which was way back in 2007 and 2008. And Hamilton was his next show. So when Lynn came to me and said, I'm gonna make a hip hop album of songs all about the first treasury secretary, Alexander Hamilton, my job was to say yes. My job is not to question, it's to imbue that artist with the spirit that I'll help you do anything you need to realize your goals. And though Lynn originally thought he would just make an album, of course, with the um, progression of time and the progression of artistry, he eventually came to see that what he was writing was a Broadway musical. And he eventually got to, of course, have his cake and eat it too, because not only did we make a great show and a great album, but then of course he made the Hamilton mixtape with all with some of the greatest artists uh, performing in the hip hop world, in the rap world, and in the R&B world today. And how did you first hook up? Is there any interesting story of you guys coming together? Well, I give my uh, then partner, Kevin McCollum, who, by the way, grew up in uh, Hawaii oh, as cool. well. <laughs> wow. um, and uh, uh, and I, did he go to Punahou High School? He went to that private school. What that's was it? A, was that's it the name, Punahou. Okay, Kevin is a Punahou graduate. I think he was one year behind a man named Barry Obama, <laughs> who became known as Barack Obama when he became an adult. Wow. But in any event... Um, you know, Kevin and I were partners. We had done Rent. We had done Avenue Q. And um, Kevin heard about a reading that was going on in the basement of the drama bookshop in New York City of a new rap musical called In the Heights. Huh. And uh, when Kevin went to see it, he literally called me on the phone. He said, I have our next show. Wow. And so within days of that experience, Lynn, his director, Tommy Kale, and his team were in our office starting to talk about those very questions that I was just saying. Yeah. What do you need to make your show realize its goals? And in, in, the, in the case of In the Heights, what was so interesting was that Lynn had written its first iteration when he was a sophomore at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And it was his director, Thomas Kale, who persuaded him uh, once he had moved to New York City to take a fresh look at it, mm and see how do we make this one act expand into a full two act musical. And with the book writer, Kiara Hodes, they were able to realize that goal. So my job or my pleasure, my reward is to forge these um, nurturing, rewarding relationships with artists who I can help fulfill their missions. Well, it would not be right to also, because we've heard about Hamilton and in the Heights and uh, how it all sort of started for you as a kid, which is a great story, very inspiring and shows how important that early childhood nurturing, to borrow a word from you, is. Uh, digging into some fun stuff from your past on the note of some of what you were just talking about, you also produced Sting's musical, The Last Ship, based on the concept album of the same name. So if there's any great, because storytelling is a great part of what we do on the radio, you probably know that, and you're involved with telling them on stage so well. Share the story of, of how it came up and perhaps either first meeting Sting or any fun stories with him that, that you think are fun and maybe bring uh, some joy to you to tell. Well, sure, with pleasure. I love Sting. And I loved his musical, The Last Ship. Um, the Last Ship started with an article that was on the front page of the New York Times. I'm going to say it was in the summer of 2000 and 
uh, I don't know, 10 or 11. And um, on the front page of the Times, there was this black and white photo of a ship worker in Gdansk, Poland. And he had a really scraggly face. He had age. He had weather. He had hard knocks on his face. And it was an article about a priest in Gdansk, Poland, who wanted to do something to lift up all of the unemployed, dispossessed, um, blue collar workers from that community who had lost their jobs over the last recession. Mm -hmm. Men who had nowhere to go and nothing to do, and who most importantly had lost their sense of belonging. So he said, I'm gonna take over this abandoned shipyard and I'm gonna get this architect to draw me some plans for free. And I'm gonna get this iron foundry to give me the steel. And I'm gonna bring these men together and we're gonna build a ship and they're gonna sail around the world. And this happened in Gdansk, Poland. Mm. And when the New York Times wrote about it, um, the ship was mostly finished, but they had not yet set sail for the world. And that story inspired Sting. And then his manager found me, we were acquaintances, and said, what do you think of this idea? And I said, hold it. <laughs> I loved that story. I read it too. And huh. she said, he wants to make it. I said, it's a musical. And that's how, you know, we started it. And then my job was to bring Sting, a book writer, to help write the dialogue, to help um, conceive the characters, mm. to help him create the plot. Uh, my job was to bring him the director and then, to, of course, to raise the money and do the show. And um, he made a, album, uh, a concept album by himself first, and then eventually we did the show. And then eventually he decided to be in the show as well. So it was a really beautiful journey and a very um, lucky experience for me to work with an artist that um, passionate, right. that rigorous, and... Um, and that um, inspiring. You ever go to his place in Italy, hang there, where, his, where, where he grows the wine? <laughs> you know what? My writers went to his place in Italy, but I didn't get there. So uh, I guess I'm going to have to uh, wait till the next time for that one. And what's a favorite enduring memory of being with him that, that uh, you take away from all those times? Something that just sticks out that makes you smile, makes you go, you talk about being lucky, just a fun memory. Sure. Well, I remember sitting in his beautiful um, dining room in London and him picking up his um, guitar and playing for us the new uh, song that the leading man sings oh, wow. um, uh, to his son at the beginning of Act Two. Um, and uh, how lucky am I when I'm in the presence of an artist who comes in with a new song? Right. And shares it to you in that kind of intimate, personal... Yeah, and just picks up the guitar and plays. Nah, I like that kind of stuff. I remember one time on his last, his farewell tour, Glenn Campbell was here in Honolulu, and um, I got, I was very, very, very lucky. Somebody at the station knew, knew people who were close to him when we got to interview him on this little boat, very private, only a handful of people. It was like four or five of us, and eventually Glenn picked up the acoustic and just sat there. He didn't remember a lot of words because he had the Alzheimer's raging at that time. But, wow, yeah, yeah, But yeah. I know what you mean about when you get up close with somebody who's sharing and trying to be nice. And uh, you really shared a lot of cool stuff today, uh, Jeffrey Seller, and original Broadway producer of Hamilton, but so much more as we've been hearing great stories about Sting and everything else. And I certainly hope that uh, being our guest here on All Things Considered that you had a good time, my brother. Hey, great interview. I love All Things Considered. And I am so looking forward to seeing our Hamilton company arrive here in Honolulu and give this amazing special experience to your citizens, residents, theater goers, music lovers over the holidays. We really appreciate it. I hope you had fun. Thank you for doing this, bro. What a pleasure. Appreciate it. Stay safe, brother Jeffrey. <laughs> Aloha, bro. Okay. Bye-bye.